there is a oriented uh, on performance. It means that the JC tools uh, that I know that not many people know, but is the core of uh, uh, Akka, Storm, uh, Net itself, uh, and uh, many other high performance projects that need uh, very high performance concurrent data structure. <coughs> the JC is the Java concurrency. And uh, uh, I'm forking France on Twitter, so you can find me there. Okay, so let's start. How many people here love concurrent, concurrent stuff and programming? <laughs> okay. Uh, how many people think to be good at concurrent programming? That, that it is common. Me, me as well, I haven't uh, raised my hand in that. So it, it's complex to be with this kind of stuff. But uh, we, I will uh, try today, to tonight, uh, with you, uh, trying to be on the, in, the, in the shoes of the developer that want to create the fastest concurrent queue ever. Not from the point of view of the user, okay? But I need to introduce a couple of terms before. So the first one is the difference between uh, parallel and concurrent. So I've taken the definition from this book, the Art of Concurrency. There are many other definitions. I kind of love this one. And uh, it says that a concurrent system is a system that supports having many different actions in progress at the same time. Okay? While a parallel system instead allows to have many operation or several operation or action simultaneously executing. So the difference is that with concurrent you deal with different action progress. With parallel you allow them to be executed. If this one is not that clear, it's fine. It can be made better in this way, for example. If you look at the left side, a concurrent system doesn't have necessarily to have several executors of the action. But if you look uh, here at this point, uh, the time is flowing down, you have the green process and the blue process that both as, as progressive. Okay? They are not completed, but the, the, their action has moved forward even if there is just one executor. With parallel, uh, a parallel system instead, uh, you have uh, several executors and uh, independently by the number of steps in which you split the action that uh, form your processes, you can uh, allow to both to be executed uh, effectively at the same time. Okay? So that, that's a better definition somehow, visually. But the point is that uh, why the people uh, really want to go parallel, okay? Because I really want to convince you that it's a very good idea to build the fastest queue ever, right? Okay, the people choose to go parallel for several reasons. But it's something that's for free or it has a cost. This kind of cost can be measured. There are models that uh, allow you to understand how much it costs to go parallel. And uh, the answer is yes, it exists. Anyone knows about Amdal? Has ever heard about Amdal? Okay, it's, it's cool that you don't know it. Right? Because if you go to Wikipedia and search for Amdal law, you will find that uh, this Amdal law explains the cost to go in parallel. So if you want to scale your system, so you increase the load, uh, and you get more throughput, okay? You, it, it shapes uh, a line that uh, explains how much you can expect to scale, okay? But the point that uh, is that not many people know uh, that Amdal wasn't a math guy, was the one that uh, wanted to sell the people not a multiprocessor computer, and it was uh, so good in uh, telling that to our customer that was able to demonstrate 
without any math proof, that there wasn't a good idea to buy a multiprocessor. Several years later, uh, will, uh, has been published the Amdal facts that uh, hasn't been published by Amdal himself, was been published by a math guy instead that used the same concept uh, that was just intuitive from Amdal and kind of put in equation, but no one had ever demonstrated until very recently by Neil Gunter. Neil Gunter is the guy behind this book, uh, Guerrilla uh, Capacity Planning. Uh, this book is very interesting for many reasons. First, uh, is not uh, related to computer science, because uh, the capacity of scale, scaling uh, is something that can be applied to anything. When I mean anything, I mean even an agile program. The reason behind it, the people turn using agile programming is uh, to allow scaling, so be able to react to a lot of work, uh, increasing the throughput in uh, produced project, uh, move forward, okay? I'm not interested today, and I'm not a math guy, to explain you this one. It's not important for our talk, but I want you at least to know the two or three factor that somehow affect scalability. Because as a developer of the fastest queue ever, we need to know which kind of things uh, we should avoid or we should use in order to make this queue faster. Okay? So let's start first uh, with the, the left uh, figure. In the left one, you have on the x axis uh, the load of the system, while on the y axis you have the throughput. So ideally, this line is what, what we really want to achieve. So a linear scaling, okay? In this case, we can say that yes, we are scaling right. We are scaling right. On the right, instead, we have this alpha factor called contention that uh, represent the part uh, of your system or, or of your problem or your data structure that are shared between the parties that want uh, to progress, to move forward. Okay? Could be a, a lock inside the data structure or the super big lock inside the, in front of the database or whatever can be in Agile, one of, of your mates that is so good that the people use it for everything. And given that the people use just him for everything, it became a shared resource, because anyone asks him the things. It's exactly the same. In this case, given that at a certain point, the work behind this resource will be enqueued and delayed, you have a diminishing return. So you won't scale anymore, okay? In the case in which the, the, the contention or the amount of shared resource is so high that uh, the, most of the, the work will be delayed, you will get even more diminishing return, but never negatively. This third figure is the Amdal load. If you search through Wikipedia, you will find this one. But no one has ever demonstrated it yet, until this one. In the last figure, instead, we have the reality, the very sad reality. I perform load testing most of the time, and there is a certain point with the load until you will get most of the time something like that. But why and how? That's important for our queue is that this uh, third factor that has been introduced in uh, this universal scalability law called the cross fault penalty or coherency cost beta. How, how to describe it? For example, given that the, the relation with the agile is maybe even more clear to be understood than just component programming, uh, in Agile, you have to do stand-up meeting. It's correct. 
but uh, just consider the case in which uh, you have uh, five times a day stand-up meeting, okay, and you can't move forward in your work until you get all the five stand-up meetings completed. It obviously slows you down, okay, and uh, dependent by the number of the teams, you have uh, a certain amount inter of interaction with all these people that uh, will slow you down even more. So, if you have n parties that uh, represent a graph of your system and uh, you need uh, to count how many interactions you can have, uh, is the number of the edge of the graph that uh, is uh, all the n squared. That's exponential, right? This cost. Oh, what's happening? Uh, anyway, the, this cost uh, is the the one that makes you not scale anymore, but uh, even worse, scale ne negatively because it's exponential. Okay, it can be <coughs> applied uh, really <coughs> agile and data structure. Not only if you have a consensus algorithm uh, like Paxos, for example. And uh, in order to agree to get a quorum, you need uh, all the parties to agree on a decision. You can't scale. By definition, you will get a negative scale because all the people must agree, right? Okay, that's very important. And uh, let's move forward. Neil Gunter is really a great guy. I suggest you, if you have a Twitter, to tweet him. Is not only very nice but very attractive, maybe too much, and he is very, very mad against Amdal because he tried very hard to get an equation named after him. But if you look at the name, is a universal scalability law, no, not a name Gunter law. While Amdal has never written in entire life any math and has an entire equation after him. So, it's a strange story about this guy, but it is actually very good. So, in, a, in our uh, mind, when we want to make it something to scale, we design things like that. So we have many things uh, that uh, some way are very ordered and all together push some load. But the reality is that most of the time we get this, in which you have some lock, that block everything, and you have this Chuck Norris car going some direction <laughs> that we don't know why <laughs> has that happened. It, it's complex. Given that this scalability law applied really for real to computer science, building a sca really scalable architecture is not that easy. And that's why we arrived to the key. In the, in the latest period, uh, the last period, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of architecture that are based on actors, one core, one thread per core, and so on, in order to allow us to make, uh, to reduce the contention between all the parties, in order to be able to know which part uh, are shared resource, which part uh, communicate with each other, and you know the cross talk penalty what it is. But in this case, if you are single threaded and you want to communicate with other with something, that something, what it is? Q. Not the cat, but I will explain you why I put the cat here. And a Q effectively is very easy to calculate Q. And uh, maintain all the invariant that you were expecting in a communication. So you have a first, uh, first in, first out. And uh, it has uh, all the, the bits that are shared clear, clearly defined. If you have uh, a, an entire architecture of your system and that uh, you need to control which part are shared, which not, which part uh, talk with each other or not, then you risk to have the one that we have seen in the previous slide. But uh, simplify your architecture and use proper tools. This one could be a good tool. And why is a cat? Because a cat is a cube. You know, you, know, you put the food and but beside that, any cube has several operations 
that clearly define what the queue is. But if you look to the Java collection, it's not that easy because you have an <coughs> iterator on concurrent queues, you have uh, an iterator in which you can remove in place that uh, is perfectly clear how they work uh, on single thread, but that is not that clear how they can work uh, when they are concurrent. So, for this talk, uh, given that we are the developer of the queue, we need to choose. But uh, our queue is not just a queue, it's a messenger passing a queue. The target is uh, to communicate things. So the kind of API we, we will focus today is this one. Offer, poll, that is kind of related to his acting, but is not always like that. It means offer a poll that return null, it means that is empty has to return true. Okay? But it is not something that uh, must, must mean that way. It's just to make it more Java friendly. The sites that, uh, given that it's just used to send a message to another core or another thread, probably we are not interested. But for telemetry, we have to provide it. Because uh, if the queue is always full, maybe it's better to make it bigger. Or maybe it's better to provide more back pressure on the other side. So, for whatever reason, having a site is good. Okay? And we have several choices as a developer to, to, to be made in order to choose out how to implement this thing. The first, in my opinion, and very important one is bounded or unbounded. And uh, I, I really want to convince you in that, like before for the study is low. So if it's bounded, there are obviously the advantages, some of them. One is that it's easy to propagate the pressure, given that you can uh, push and, uh, and fix the amount of element. When you get faults uh, while offering, you know that the queue is full. And it allows you, it enables you to create a chain of, of behavior that maybe will do something different instead of continuously pushing you up. Okay. And sometimes, but it's not always related, you don't need to create a new element. That means that you don't need to have the garbage collector in the middle because the number of elements already sitting in the queue is fine, fine. Maybe you can pull them somehow. And uh, there are obviously the, the, some downside and the back pressure as well. Because as a developer of the queue, <coughs> it is fine. But as a user, if you have uh, the Java executor service in which uh, after execute, it return false. As, as a developer, what you will do? It's not that easy. You need to provide, provide something friendly to the user. But tonight, uh, we are developer. So, I don't care. I prefer back pressure, for example. It's up to us. It's a choice. Let's uh, choose unbounded instead. In the case in which is unbounded, to be honest, uh, but the simplification for the user that doesn't have to think about back pressuring, uh, there are no good reasons, even from a, from a mathematical point of view. Indeed, anyone knows about Little? Okay, Little uh, is a math guy that has worked for several years for the telephone bell company. And uh, he's the, the one that has made the uh, queuing theory. And I don't think that something less appropriate can be choose because uh, given that is a queuing theory, it applied a lot for a concurrent queue. And this one is one of the law of little. We are not interested in the math, but there are some analogies that allow us to understand better what I mean. Consider the case of a bar with a room okay, that has a certain capacity in, in terms of the number of people that can be hosted inside the room. And the people that enter the bar enter with a certain speed. 
with speed I mean the arrival rate. Okay? And uh, in the same room we have maybe one bartender that can deliver coffee, cocktail or whatever. If you make the room infinite and you are the last one to enter, how much time will be needed before you will be served? Infinite. Because you risk to have an infinite amount of people in front of you that got to be served, right? So unless the bartender is flesh, is very complex that will be able to serve all the people. You need to increase the number of bartenders, but there is something that can't work. At the end, it's infinite, and you have infinite latencies. That's why having a bonded queue is nice, but if you have ever produced uh, something uh, at the infrastructure level, like I'm working on Artemis, the broker. We use uh, sometimes unbounded queues. And sometimes we have an issue without having uh, auto memory, in which uh, in one queue you have uh, two billions, no, two billions now, but one billion available. And obviously you start to have uh, crazy latencies for many reasons. So in our case that we are developer, we don't want it to happen. So in this case we will choose for our this talk. Then is related but not completely. Bounded amount that we have chosen array or linked queue based. And for this one I, I admit I don't have many things to be said good with the linked queue, but I really want to convince you that it is a very bad idea to use linked queue once. How? This issue, if you want, you can search it on, uh, on, uh, on the Apache Jara, is an issue on a Red Hat product. Uh, and uh, the, the guy that has created the, the Cupid dispatch, uh, the, the dispatch is a router, and as the name suggests, uh, it has to scale, given that it is a router, a router. Okay? And uh, uh, this guy made it in uh, C, so he's not in Java. And they do not want to use an allocator, but they want to pull each of the instances created. And given that uh, the kind of architecture is a shared nothing architecture, they have uh, one thread for each core, and uh, they use uh, an object pool for each core in order to reuse each object that has been created and then released into the pool. What kind of data structure they have used for the object pool? A link and a key. Because it sounds somehow smart, but I can tell you why. Not just a link and key, but an intrusive link and key. Not many people know about what intrusive is. By looking at your face, maybe you don't know about it, but it's fine. It's fine because it is really something horrible from a design point of view, but if you look at the kernel code, is just intrusive linked list. How they work? Instead of having the notion of a node, you have the person or directly the element that became the node itself. So Francesco Negro as a pointer to the next and the previous. It's very bad for the design because you can put the same element in two different ways is if you think about it. Because if it is in one, it will have the next just for that specific list. But besides that, uh, there is some merit behind this idea. And the idea is that uh, I want to save the creation of the node and I want to save the pointer chasing. The pointer chasing is uh, I'm the node element and I need to reach uh, person or whatever component I'm referring to and then the next. Okay. Seems a very smart idea. I replaced this data structure with a, a, not an array but a, a linked queue of array. And not just an array but array of pointers. On the paper it shouldn't work well. But the reality was that as improved by 40 the performance of the router, that is quite a lot, 
and the now the router scale. That where if you think about it. I'm using an external data structure. I'm not using anymore the same element. I'm creating a new element and I'm using an array of pointers. Why it should be faster? But if you look here, it's very small. I attached one document that has been my, my mates completely gone crazy for a couple of months. The Doom 3 BFG technical guide. How many people know about Doom? Okay. Doom is a shooter, first person shooter. Very old, very old. Doom 3 not that old, but quite old anyway. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, years ago, John Carmack, that uh, was the developer of uh, the Doom engine, wanted to port it from PS3 and Xbox uh, 360 to the new console. It means uh, PS4 and Xbox One. Uh, the new console was made with a very different architecture from the previous one. And uh, during its analysis, to understand why the same engine on a new computer totally sucks, he found that the reason was the intrusive link of this. But why? Because the caches work different in the new architectures. But I want to explain to you better this concept, because it will help us to design the other queue, not for other reasons. So, how many people remember even a little bit of how caches work? Just, no, not the algorithm, but just the idea that you have uh, an hierarchy of uh, caches and that they are used uh, just to save the thing that the CPU is so fast and the memory is so slow. So you try to minimize this difference by taking the things you care the most near to you. That it kind of makes sense. The thing is that uh, in many computer science uh, courses, the, the, the teacher do not explain how real caches work. And uh, the, the part that is most interesting is that uh, it's not just an implementation detail. It's about 20 years that they work that way, so probably it's worth to know how they work, for example. And there is uh, one thing that re is really important for the improvement I made by just saving of using that term, uh, intrusive link at least. There is uh, one little cache between uh, the L1 and the L2, and we are in the same core, right? So it's just one core, single track. <coughs> we have L1, that is the one nearest to the core, and we have the L2, that is the one right, one right below. The line field buffers are a little, not, not just a cache, it's something more smarter than a cache. A sort of hash map, but, but of thin sites that allows to the, the L1 cache to issue more than one cache misses in parallel. Why in parallel? I mean, the single, single thread is one core, and that's the beautiness of the thing. Uh, the thing is that uh, the illusion that your code is single threaded is just an illusion. Because the CPU can speculate to reach other parts of the memory, even if you don't know about it. Okay? So if you have a for loop that uh, is iterating through an array of pointer, and you don't have anything in your code, in Java, in your coding, which uh, you don't use uh, the previous value before going to the next. So the, there are no logics that prevent the CPU to try to issue all those values all together. Okay? And uh, you are using Java. So you have uh, the element inside the array that are scattered along the heap. The heap. You don't know where they are. And maybe it's the first time you are assessing them. So, obviously, you will get a cache miss. You have a 10 element. Okay, with modern architecture, the cost of getting 10 element is one. The one that is lower, because they are able to get at least 10 
request in parallel. Okay? But consider the very sad case of an weekend list, in which uh, before getting to the next element, you need to reach the present element. And uh, you can't get to the next next uh, until you get to the next. You have a data dependency. The CPU never will go to the next one. Every time will make you pay the old cost of getting one element per time. And you will get the full cost each time. That's why an array of pointer works so much better, even if it's so counterintuitive. Okay? I don't know if I can listen, but the number talked very clearly. Indeed, the kind of data structure I'm using is an array of pointer, but was a stack for different reasons to, to not break their code that was relying on using the stack. But uh, given that it was a stack, uh, the CPU wasn't able to know much more which kind of element want to get. But just uh, as saved one cache miss. Indeed, I told you that the improvement was about over 40%. That is exactly one cache miss less. Because in the other you will get two cache miss. Go to the current and go to the next uh, and go back uh, a step. In my case you will say one. So you are getting about half uh, of the cost. You, indeed you will get 40% of performance more. It kind of makes sense. Okay? And if you don't know, use an array. It's always better. Okay. <coughs> and university teach about linking list, but it's a very bad idea. They should stop. There are other things we are interested in as a developer in the queue, always from that perspective. I told you that uh, uh, if you have a very giant API, it's so much complex to make optimization because you have to deal with the iterator, all, all stuff that we, we don't care. But uh, we can push further this idea and uh, given that we are designing a shared nothing totally architecture it means that uh, you have one thread per core and if you want to talk with another core for example uh, you will push the message directly on the queue of that specific core so it means that each queue will have one producer and one consumer at time the consumer is the one that wants to read the message to just push it. And the producer will be the one that wants to talk exactly with him, for example. Okay? It is a mesh of, uh, of cues. And if you think that is a stupid idea, I, I have uh, this kind of talk before. There is a, a, a replacement of Cassandra built in C++ called CLDB. And uh, they have raised uh, crowdfunding. They get enough money to build it. And uh, the, their mission was uh, we will make it uh, 10 per faster. 10 per is a lot. Really a lot. And it, is, it means a lot to stuff. The thing is that uh, they will be able to do it. Finally. Why? They were using that kind of, of, of uh, architecture. Okay. And it's nice. Uh, because uh, Cassandra itself, uh, that is built uh, by DataStax, uh, very recently has moved the same kind of, uh, of, of architecture because it really works well. So, to close the, the circle, the kind of cues today we will try to implement are the single producer, single consumer, the simplest one, but maybe probably the most interesting. It will allow us to simplify the implementation and the, the, the assumption that it has allows us to push even further the kind of optimization we can do. And we will do it. Basically, we need buffer. Always we need buffer at the end. Need just another couple of terms to be able then we can start. But is then just start is half of the presentation. Okay. Log free programming. Given that we are the developer, we want to tell to the user 
which kind of guarantees our API provider. Okay. It's something that in the Java collection we don't have. And it's another very sad stuff. But I can tell you why those are important. Okay. Uh, if you go to the concurrency freaks blog, uh, it's quite interesting and well done. Maybe too much technical, but it's made by one of the guys that work on paper, this kind of stuff, very academic. Uh, but a couple of things are quite clear. It's not that bad. And this one uh, is nice. It uh, split uh, the, the definition of the, of the type of algorithm or, or data structure depending on the kind of uh, progress guarantees you will tell to the user when they are using the API. A blocking uh, data structure is quite clear how it works. It's the one with the lock, for example. It's effectively blocking in every sense. The tree variation depends on the kind of lock you use. So is a, an unfair lock is a lock that uh, you don't know which one will take the lock. Maybe there is one party that will never be able to enter the lock. Is unfair indeed. A starvation-free blocking algorithm is the one instead that allows each one to get the chance to enter at a certain point. And obstruction-free, I don't remember anymore. <laughs> you just need to look at it too hard too much. But the blocking is the one important. Lock free, simpler, seems. Uh, lock free, no lock, finish. But uh, it means another couple of stuff, not so obvious. Given that uh, it just means no, no lock, it doesn't mean that it's faster. It's important. There are, it is a progress guarantees. It just means that there, is, there isn't any lock. But if it will take, and sometimes it happens, an infinite amount of steps before getting completed is not free. So if one of your best friends will come at home and tell, okay, I created data structure, is faster than yours because it's not free, is a lie. Most of the time it is not, to be honest. Depend on the problem. Weight free is the place in which we want to be as a developer and as a user as well. Because weight free, it means not only that it's log free, but that we tell the, the, the user that the call in that API offer is empty, dependent on, on the call, the API of the method, we return after a finite amount of step. Can be even very large, but is finite. When is weight free? It's just finite. When is weight free bounded? It means that it's finite, but it's somehow related to the number of uh, parties that are in that moment calling that same method. Okay? The number of threads, okay? for example. Weight free population obvious is even better. It means that uh, the number of steps in which each of the elements will complete will be exactly a certain number at max, independent by the number of parties. That's the best one. In this case, the kind of data structure that we will see during the, this presentation will be mostly weight free, bounded, indeed, we have just two parties, so it's easier, and just one log free. But I can tell you which one is log free in the middle. Okay. Let's start. These are the algorithm of, of today. Okay. And if you look at the data, it's already very interesting because uh, all the people say that uh, the, the papers are here. Shoulders uh, of giant. You click and you have all the papers. But probably we will uh, exhaust everything here today. It's very simple from a certain point. But anyway, the date. This one is old, kind of old. I'm old as well, <laughs> it is old. But uh, the other one has, are quite new, very new to be honest. And if someone will tell that concurrent queues are a solved problem, it's not that true to be honest. There is a, a huge difference in time between this one, and the <coughs> difference in performance is 
huge. And we will see how. So, let's start with the Leslie, Leslie Lamport Q. Okay. The Leslie Lamport Q, the name is an engineer working for Microsoft, and he created, at least most people think that he's the one that has created Paxos, so it's his fault. Uh, the, the lock algorithm, the fair lock algorithm inside the Java is built by him, the, the algorithm itself. He created the concurrent linked queue, the algorithm, with the Scott Mitchell, blah, 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 blah. It's always this guy. Okay? He's created the, this algorithm. So, let's start with the rule. Mm, not sure if you can see. I can try with this one. Can you move? Is that? Yeah, there you go. Mm. Ah, not that much. Let me try with the blue one. Yeah. This one, are you? Are you? Okay, maybe. But believe me, the people won't need to read exactly what I write. Right. Let's, let's see. So this one is a ring box, right? We have, uh, how many people know about atomic long? Okay, so you have uh, the, the primitive inside Java that allows you to write concurrently a long. A long is a kind of number that it will take quite a lot to finish. I can tell you several million of years until you reach the end, if you increase it even very quickly. So it's fine if we use a lot, but for what? Uh, in many paper, the academic people really love to talk about tail and head. I hate this term. So I will use producer sequence and consumer sequence because we have one producer and one consumer. It's easier to be remember. So we have a producer sequence, that's my comment long, and the consumer sequence. They both start with zero. What do they represent? They represent the position of the producer and the consumer at a certain point of time. Okay? For uh, many different reasons, in order to make it simpler but more clear, we make those two sequences able to progress continuously in, until infinite, even when we will reach the end of the, the capacity of the ring buffer, okay? Because if they will change from time to time, when you got here, you were expecting to be zero again. But the point is that we won't do it. We did make it different. We will use the modulus operation instead, using the capacity of the ring buffer, so the size, the ring buffer, the max size of the ring buffer, to know in which position of it to write. <coughs> in this way, if we want to know the size of the queue, it's very easy, because you will check producer minus consumer sequence, and that's by definition is the distance between them, the element not yet consumed. Very simple. And uh, what kind of progress guarantees it has? Is a weight free operation of previous because the sites will take just only one. You are asking to of the of that you have a number, we return it back. It's not blocking, it's not blocking. Okay, let's move. What a producer is expecting to be if you call it offer. If you call offer, first you need to know where the consumer is, right? Why? Because if for any reason the consumer is very slow and the producer has already produced many values and is here, for example, but the consumer hasn't started yet, you want to know where is the, the consumer in order to save uh, 
from other writing elements that you haven't, that has been yet consumed, right? So each time the producer needs to know it, if move forward, then we check where is the consumer, is the consumer is distant enough, you know that he can pull, uh, offer a new element, and then move forward to the next uh, sequence element, the, 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 the producer sequence. The consumer on the other side, that's what I told you that is not important. And the, the consumer on the other side is perfectly symmetric and has to do exactly the same thing. So uh, consider that you have written one element here and then you have the producer here. The producer sequence is one. Okay. The consumer is <coughs> here. The thing is that uh, he, the consumer doesn't know if is empty or not. Okay. In order to know if it's empty and return one, we need to check where is the producer and if the producer sequence is different from the consumer sequence, is no, you know that there is some value in it. And in that case, it will consume the value, clean out the slot, because we live in a Java world, and if you won't do it, you will have a memory link that will stay forever until you will overwrite it. And after cleaning up it, you will move forward <coughs> the position of the sequence. So you will get one and one. Obviously, if you try to consume the game, as I told you, you will check the producer sequence. They are the same. Indeed, the size is zero, because uh, one minus one gives zero, and then you can return null. Very simple. Okay, there are about 20 pages in that demo paper for that, but it is exactly the same algorithm. Okay, is this one finished? This is the last example. But I want to invite you to ask yourself. Uh, if it is a good idea as a developer to use this kind of algorithm. And uh, I can really tell you that it is a very bad thing. Why? The reason is simple and is a kind of related to the universal scalability law. That's why I bother you with that. Okay. I told you that the producer each time needs to ask the consumer what it is. And the consumer each time needs to talk somehow, query the value to the, to the producer where you are so I can do my work. How it, this thing can scale? If you have just two parties and both need to talk each other continuously before moving forward, I don't think you can scale that much. Okay? And indeed, uh, the performance sucks of this like structure. But uh, how many people know about Martin Thompson? Has ever heard about it? He was a performance gangster coming from the trading system of London that has created many very cool data structures, concurrent data structures, including this structure. This structure is being used by uh, Max, the uh, trading company, for many years and uh, is used internally in a Storm. In uh, ma many frameworks that do processing in parallel of, of stream and uh, in uh, log4j2, if I remember correctly. So it's very good with data structure. And after uh, 40 years, that quite a lot, he has created the, probably the smartest and seamless optimization that made this algorithm to really work and is related a lot with the universal scalability law. He has added the other two long here and here. The name of this is consumer sequence cached by the name, but you will see why. The other one is the producer sequence cached. The producer is interested into these two. 
why the consumer is interested into this too, but how it can be used. If you are a producer, here, is with an empty queue, right? And uh, you really want to push a new value, you can do like that instead. Instead of asking this one every time, you can ask it the first time when, when it's empty, and you know that you have how many elements to be offered the whole queue. Okay? And you save this one here. Or you can just use it a different name, but the idea is the same. If you have another element to be offered, you don't need to ask again that time. Because uh, given that you are the only producer, that's why we have simplified the environment, <coughs> and there is just one consumer, the, and we have said that, that we are using models, uh, this one can only grow. So, given that they can only grow, this one can be, became less. The consumer can move backward and just continue consume, right? You are, uh, it, that means that if you know that you have all this space to be filled, you really don't need to ask each time where is the consumer. You will use directly what you have here until you will reach the old cash at the and in, the, in this case, you will refresh that value, asking again to the consumer where you are. It allows you for a very, a very important case that exists in reality to have an important optimization to reduce the coherency cost, the cost of continuously asking that value. Which case is the, the word, the cues, in general, are not meant to be hammered by thread. Because it's not like that that work the world itself. If you have data coming from a network buffer, for example, they will arrive in packets. So most of the time you will have a small burst of value and you will push it into a queue. And given that we are smart, we want the queue to be always empty most of the time. But why? Think about the universal scalability of all the agile and energy. If you are a developer and you have already four projects to work on, and sometimes you get an emergency, you need to fix a thing. How much time you will take to react? If you can't prioritize things, you need to finish the old work. So a system, in order to be reactive, has to have most of the time empty queues. So improving the performance of the queue when it's mostly empty and get a burst of work is a very important business case because are the one in which you want to be reactive. If you are already full as a queue, you are not able to do any more work. And it's fine if you are slow to react because you are already slow in that case. Okay. We need to be fast when we can be fast. Let's see that the consumer can do exactly the same optimization. So, if the consumer wants to consume something, okay, and the producer we have, have been able to produce a, a burst of element, for example. So we have this element has been written, 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 until arriving here, okay? So the producer has written these three, four values, okay? The consumer needs to know, in order to know if it's empty, where the producer is. It will ask it once. If it found that these numbers are different, it can cache that the producer is at four, and the next time, after it will consume this element uh, and will be here. You don't need anymore to know where the producer will be. Because at the worst, uh, the producer uh, 
has produced new value. But uh, you have already to finish what you already have. So why ask again, where is the producer? Better to finish all the element until you will arrive uh, here. When the consumer effectively has consumed uh, all these, uh, all these elements, uh, and uh, they are clean, cleaned up, uh, okay, you will ask, where is the producer? And maybe, given that you haven't disturbed uh, it so much, probably he has moved even forward, and you have another burst of element. And in that way, you will ask, uh, instead of each step uh, to know where it is, uh, just maybe one, two, three, depending how much uh, is quick the producer to push back. But it will be quick, uh, will be very quick, because uh, now it doesn't need you to know on each step where the consumer will be. Okay, so that's the kind of, of optimization built by Martin Thompson, and this one make this very old algorithm very competitive. And most of the people will tell me, okay, that's finished. I mean, it's already very quick. Why you need it to make it even quicker? Because uh, there is another important optimization that uh, every people has ever had uh, in front of their eye, but it's very stealthy. And when you need it, uh, you, you want to do it. Because in Java, I, I told you one thing, right? <coughs> I told you that uh, the consumer has to rule out the element, right, to, to save from the lake. The null, not null thing is an important information because it can tell you if the element is present or not, right? So if you are a producer and you know that you are here and you want to know if you can produce a value, you really don't need to know neither the cache of value. You will check just if it is not finished. And in that case, if it is none, you will put a new value. And you will move forward. Very simple. Okay? It's not finished. It's even worse on the other side. Because at least uh, you are dealing here and useless operation on the producer if you think about it. Because the producer is checking into the element. It's strange. But effectively he would have asked for the consumer sequence or the cache of value of it. So it is an additional operation other than just offering a new value. But it's cool because it's very simple. The consumer on the other side can do exactly the same thing. And the nice part is, the, is that he won't uh, lose uh, neither one operation is exactly what the consumer has meant to do. From the beginning, the consumer already has to read the next value in the best case, right? And indeed, can read the next value. And if there is something, it will null out and move the sequence. Finish. This one is the fast flow algorithm, has been built at Pisa in Italy, because we are, we are smart to not work, I believe. <laughs> but uh, the, the thing is that effectively is, is a very smart thing. And it doesn't have any downside until a Japanese guy produces another paper called VQ, telling that uh, there are ways in which you can improve. And really, it's finished. The, the, the algorithm of fast closure are probably four lines of code for uh, all the paper. That is 20 pages. Anyway. But the PQ is very interesting instead. And it's kind of related to how caches work instead. So I need now to move the other side and uh, show you something more related to the because it is that kind of optimization. Just uh, by intuition, I told you that the universal scalability law is related. You can't disturb uh, one guy that is working 
because it, you will flow, flow in, in down. It makes sense. And for the Q, it's the same. But uh, if you think about uh, the ring buffer itself, how it, it, it is packed inside the CPU for real, okay? And I will simplify the hierarchy of CPU. We have uh, one cache, the uh, one core that is here, and another core that is here. This one, uh, we believe, is the core where the producer is, the trend of the producer. This one instead is the core of the consumer instead. We have the L1 cache that is local to this core, right? And obviously we have the same cache on the other side. We should, in theory we should have the L2 cache, but for for a simplification, we would say we use it now. Is not important to demonstrate the, the, the idea. The thing uh, is that uh, each cache has each line that is uh, nearly 64 byte. Okay. Here we have the L2 caches and our nice run. If these two core has to talk, how they can talk? Through the L3 caches, because it is the one across the core, right? They can use this one that are local. Okay? The, this cache line has the same size, so it is uh, always 64 bytes. We have uh, this nice ring buffer. It means that, for example, a part of it uh, from here to here, uh, obviously the entire ring buffer is here, okay? Because it is in RAM, obviously, is an array, should be somewhere, okay? But uh, on L3, you have the part of it uh, they are interested in. Let's consider the case of uh, an empty queue, okay? For an empty queue, you have the producer and the consumer that are very near, right? Given that it is empty, you have the consumer that is obsessive to ask uh, the element. But the element obviously is not. Okay? And the producer maybe is stop, isn't doing anything. In this case, we can expect that the part of the ring buffer in which the producer and the consumer the next element to be read is on L3 because it is being assessed by both continuously. So from a local point of view, it makes sense that it is here. And not only is here for sure, because the producer each time, uh, the next time the producer assessed that part of the ring buffer was here. Okay? The consumer, on the other side, given that it's continuously asking that specific position into the array, obviously, is here as well. And they are mapping the same memory. Okay. The, the caches are not by reference. They are physically copying the old stuff each time. So, if the consumer want to know something about this specific position here and the producer hasn't modified yet is not a big deal because there is a coherency protocol inside the caches that will tell okay you have you are the one that that has accessed exclusively this cache line that because the producer isn't doing anything, right? Only the, 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 the consumer is loading continuously. But it's of, uh, owned, owned by the consumer. If the producer will start to produce value, what's happening? It happens that he will tell, hey, I want to write, but we have said that uh, 
it has to check if it's null. So from E, this cache line became invalid. And the, the value will be propagated to both. And both will get a shared cache line. Because as the name suggests, it's shared. No. Then the producer, again, will, will find that effectively it's null. So it can push and back, right? And in that case, it became modified. It will be propagated. Why? Because this one is continuously to ask me about itself. So each time the producer will try to put a new value, the consumer continuously forced to refresh up and down this one. How it can be fast? It doesn't make sense. It, it isn't happening just once, but several times. Because the producer is checking if there is something just to produce, and the consumer is doing exactly the same on the same part of memory. For one element, you are copying 64 bytes that are different elements. So the case in which is empty, that we really care about from a business perspective, is not optimized, not at all. Okay? We need to work around it. And uh, <coughs> I have a nice uh, applet, no, applet is very good. <laughs> I have a very nice uh, web page uh, that uh, explains better this coherency traffic. But uh, I believe that uh, it kind of makes sense, uh, even if they have a very bad quality of drawings. <laughs> okay, so what kind of improvement can be done to, to make it better? These Japanese guys uh, that translated the VQ are a very nice guy. The, the name is Temporal Sleeping, super good name. But it's a stupid thing what they do effectively, and it works. Uh, they, they have two kinds of, of uh, optimization. We are saying that the problem is that the consumer is obsessed by the same cache line of the, of, of, of the producer. Consumer on the producer. Right. But if you make uh, them to be at a certain distance, you don't tell them. How you can do it? The producer, no, let me make a turn for the producer, could do this thing, could uh, look ahead instead of looking here, can you look here and see here there is or not uh, something. And if it's fine here that there is already a value in, it will lie to the user, telling, no, it's good, I can do anything. Obviously, it doesn't make sense because maybe you have uh, some space here, but it allows you to maintain a certain distance that is true. It's not finished. It will improve another case. With the similar optimization we have seen with the Martin Thompson cache value. Because if instead the consumer the producer will find that uh, there is some, th there isn't anything here, now we know that there isn't anything here as well. So it can cache the can call it uh, producer need. Do not call it uh, cash. And he knows that he can write uh, at least a six value. And until he will get uh, it in the producer limit, he won't need any more to ask if the next element is null or not. And uh, it helps uh, somehow to improve the case in which uh, is full and uh, is nearly empty. Maintain a certain distance the consumer and simultaneously is able to push element in first, but is not finished. Indeed, that's the part without the cool name. The cool name is the temporary sleeping. That's on the consumer side of the thing. So, consider it in which we have a, a queue that is totally empty. 
So we have the producer, we have the consumer, okay? And it's totally empty, okay? We know that is not very nice. And even if we have used the trick to tell a lie when it's full, in order to say, yes, it's full, even if it's not, just to guarantee that you always have some more space, it would imp won't improve the case in which it's empty. It will just improve the case when it's full. But when it's empty, instead, they can do another thing. They can look ahead as a consumer if there is something here. Okay? Let's consider the case in which it is really empty. Obviously, it won't tell nothing interesting if you get now here. You can tell if the queue is empty or not. You need to the nearest to the next element in order to know if there is something. So you will do a binary search. Have halved the distance already checked. You will check here. And given that it's empty, is not enough. You need to halve them until you will get exactly to the next one as the original algorithm has to do. It seems a very stupid thing to be done. But uh, why it kind of works? Because uh, if a producer needed to produce something exactly while you are checking here, you are not anymore in the same cache line. Okay? You are kind of waiting. It's a temporal slipping. I don't know why they choose this name. But effectively, you guarantee the producer to have some time before you will get exactly here. And that's allowed the producer to be able to push a burst of load. And when it will push a burst of load, maybe as a consumer you are checking here instead of here. And you will find, okay, we have four values to be read. Then we have the consumer limit that's similar to the one without some cash and the producer that will tell we have for value to be consumed and you won't check anymore where the producer is because at worst it can be moved forward right from the point of view of the guarantees this thing is a shit for many reasons because uh, it turned a very nice weight-free algorithm in a lock-free one. Kind of lock-free one. We, why I say kind of lock-free one? Because in the paper, they, they do it uh, for quite some time. That is totally nonsense. In the variation I found on the internet, uh, built by other people, probably most marker, they, they do this uh, binary search trick, uh, avoiding to do it for quite some time. It's a finite number of steps. But if you think about it, it's kind of stupid. Because uh, uh, consider the case of, of a real uh, architecture, not academic uh, papers. If you are a core and you know that the queue is empty, maybe there are other stuff you want to do. But really, can be telemetry uh, or checking a socket or checking if there are a timing uh, element that you want to schedule because you are responsible of your own timer to be triggered. So I don't have anything to do because no one is communicating with me, but I want to return fast enough because I have to spin for quite some time. That's why this optimization works very well in the academic world, but very badly in the real world scenario. But it's fine, because BQ has been built in, from the university, and they really want to build the people on benchmarks. And it works, because from the cache's point of view, it's a nice improvement. You are, it's very rare that you are on the same cache line, because probably you are allows the, the other to burst value 
and the producer is on another cash line when you are still reading the other. Right. But in the real world, it doesn't work like that. Not, not in any part of this optimization. Uh, I need to move to the uh, now we, it's fine with the white word stuff. So you are saved from a bad We are near the end of the four papers. Quite new, I can try. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> uh, I can see part of I don't know why the let me <coughs> We can see part of the, the upper part. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Maybe the, okay. Now, now it's been good. good. I don't know what about the other ones. No, I have not. I can't see the. This one is the web page. If you click on the play, you have this whole hierarchy of caches that show better the, the one that I show on the, on the white board. <laughs> That's the English is this for the moment. Okay, we, we have learned a couple of stuff as a designer of the CPU about all these algorithms. We know that CPUs are caches and they are quite important. So much that most of the improvement on the algorithm really depend on them. And if you think that uh, yes, but uh, not many computer work like that uh, is not true. Indeed, there are a couple of very nice courses uh, on uh, MIT called the Cache of Reviews Algorithm. That is exactly the same thing I've done today. So, something that won't assume many stuff about the caches. Just that they can talk, they have the line, they have this, but not specifically the kind of coherence protocol they use. Just that they have one. It, it's very general and it works. So if you have that structure and you want to provide them a very good performance, it's not important what your CPU will do. Even if you put a do-while loop that doesn't do nothing for five iteration, it's better than use a bad to the cache. Because uh, when you use uh, not good to the cache, you will be hit very badly by the performance. And there is a very relevant paper on that called the memory barrier, not in the sense of the concurrency, but is actually the barrier that made the algorithm and the data structure slow is the memory. That's the thing we need to optimize here. And uh, we know that uh, when you design a concurrent data structure, but it means any kind of data structure, you should think really a lot about your business perspective of the user. If the user gets more money or whatever, more time or what's the important resource of the user, when the queue got a burst of element, that's the thing that you need to optimize. And in the 
the other case, it can be slower. Maybe it's not that important, maybe it is. Okay. And in this case, we have two relevant states of cases. With the Q, is kind of simpler, you can see. And we can thank a lot the laser for that. No, it's not the laser, but it, it really looks like the laser. <laughs> and it is finally it uh, on the JC tools. Is a, a, an awesome performance programmer. And uh, he has made, build uh, this uh, SPSC, it's not a trigger, RAQ, that uh, is basically taking all these optimization all together, only the good one, in just a single data structure. That effectively is in JC Tools, is in, in the broker I work for, is in ACA, in, uh, is pretty much everywhere, everywhere and uh, is probably the fastest queue for specific use cases. That's important. How it works, without uh, going very deep, we already done it. It offered like a big queue. We have seen that the big queue was looking ahead, similar to the Martin Thompson optimization. He was caching the position of the consumer to avoid continuously polling the, the consumer. But in, in BQ, the, it was lying. Even if it wasn't full, it was returning yes, it's full. Okay, for the one on JC tools, we have agreed to not do it. Mostly because the people just want to take the queue, use it instead of the one of the Java concurrency, and they just want a reliable behavior. If it's full, please tell me that it's full, but do not lie because uh, we don't want to waste space. It works anyway, it works anyway because uh, it optimizes for the most important case, and the case is when you have a burst of load and the consumer needs to keep up and read things. You don't want to slow down in the consumer. Okay, that's the thing. It pulls like a fast flow queue. The fast flow queue was very stupid. It was just reading the next element to, to check if it is the case to continue. And the people will say, why? is not using cache of value, technical is thinking kind of things. Because in reality, when you are building an architecture, first, if it is empty, I want it to be quick to tell me that. And the second, but because maybe I want to sleep, for example. So I want it to do it very quick. Or second the reason is that in a real case scenario, the consumer won't do just it doesn't make sense if you think about it. It will do something with the, with the element. And given that it's doing something, it will allow the producer to move forward. Okay? So that's why we have chosen to not pick that part of the other optimization. And there are another couple of improvements that make a lot, a lot of difference. One is the padding for force sharing. Now it's ready. We are master of caches, so now it's simpler to understand what it is the fast sharing. And uh, it, it is using power of two capacity for the sides of the ring buffer. We'll tell you this one very quickly. The, the false sharing, uh, how many people has ever heard about this problem? I can give you an analogy to understand it because it is quite uh, rough. If you have a noisy neighbor, you, you work well? No, obviously not, because they are noisy, right? If you have someone on your same desk that uh, moves the desk, that is noisy, effectively, you can't work well, okay? In Java, for example, if I have the producer of secrets and the consumer secrets, two atomic logs, and I will ask you, in the caches, uh, where they will be? Or, even better, in the memory, where they will be put. You will tell me, I'm a Java programmer, I don't do that. It's the, the garbage collector that has to think about it. But I can tell you a thing. Most garbage collectors choose to pack the members that are private to the specific class nearest to the class that uses it. So, there are very good reasons 
for that, because most code is not multi-threaded, it's single threaded. And uh, basically, if you have in your memory, there are random access memory, the producer sequence and the consumer sequence atomic log will be probably near. I told you that the cache is worth in 64 bytes. So probably they will end on the same cache, on the same cache line. It means that on the on the I use that. Uh, if you have the two cores, the cores of the producer, the cores of the consumer, and the L1 cache here, you will get the producer sequence and for free the consumer sequence, but I don't want it. And the same is for the consumer. Okay. And do you remember the case in which it was empty the cube? Why it was so bad? Because you were disturbing the same cache line of the other. And what do you think can happen if you are continuously, as a producer, it makes sense. You continuously change the producer sequence. It is continuously changing the, the consumer sequence. It means that the entire cash line will start to ping pong between the two. Okay? That's why it's called false sharing. Because I don't want to share it. But uh, you have it shared because of the garbage collector. The same happened in C++. It's the same because an allocator allocates things uh, continuously, ideally, if it is not fragmented, but depending by the temp time, you allocate uh, first one, first the second, you will get both, both near. It's not good. How can you solve it? What you really want is just a consumer sequence. Here. And you just want the producer, producer sequence here. In JDK, there is an annotation to which probably 10 people know about that called the contented. No. contented. And when you write contented over an atomic log, the JDK will tell the garbage collector to put the variable in its own cache line. That's the thing. Finish. If you want to do it without the calorie annotation, you will create a very shitty code. Indeed, uh, if you look uh, at the link here, we have found a trick uh, to make it work on IBM GDK and several GDK, but it makes the code very bad. And I think it's using uh, the hierarchy of classes. Because if you put an element in, in a part of the hierarchy of a class, in an abstract class, then you will declare another class that extends the previous one with some a lot of elements inside the letter for a padding not used. And you extend with another one class the other element, you will get the right distance between the other. But it's a shitty solution. <laughs> it works very well. Because this contender annotation works only on Oracle and there are a lot of communication. It uh, makes different. Uh, we have already, think, we know already that that makes a lot of difference because uh, that's a noisy neighbor. The scalability sucks because uh, you will have this cross code penalty continuously. Okay? That's, so it, it's a very important optimization. In this case, it scale. Without that, uh, it won't scale anymore. Okay? On concurrent linked queue in JDK, you have the contended annotation on the nodes of the tail of the end and the end. Okay. So it's very important. <coughs> Power of two capacity. This one is very important as well. Uh, I told you that in order to know in which element, in which slots you want to write or read, you need to use the modulus sovereign, right? That uh, this one is being used uh, even on array array the queue, for example, to do exactly the same things, to use it as a read buffer. Okay? How much it costs? A lot. Why it costs a lot? It is using the ID that are the same used for integer provision. Why it's so bad? 
is not actually so bad. It's for the vision. It doesn't know how to make it faster unless you will use a nice big trick. The big trick, I won't explain the entire big trick, but the idea is that if it costs uh, one number, random number, 10 cycles, and uh, is a very scarce resource, so you will have uh, not many the, the, the division unit inside the CPU, you have very few of them. If you are using that, uh, you have a share of the resource, if anyone needs to use it as well. So that's why. Not nice. This one can be turned into this operation and capacity of the ring buffer minus one. This end is the end bit. It will cost one cycle and is not a scarce resource, not at all. Okay, but you need this capacity to be a two uh, and the power of two. Finish. The, uh, it changed about 40% of the two. So it, it worked a lot. But most people tell yes, but uh, the JVM is smart. No, it's not. But why is not smart? It's because the JVM won't trust the final field of your classes. So you have the, the capacity that is one of the member of, the, of your countering queue, right? And uh, you see, it, but uh, the GWM know that is a power of two from the beginning to this final, and maybe can do by its own the same optimization, but uh, let making user models instead. He won't do it because we have a reflection in Java. And with the reflection, you can change final field. So the JVM can't trust your field and won't optimize that case. Unless you will add the JVM argument to trust final field. But it will break basically any framework. So it's not a good idea. That's the kind of optimization here. Let's look at the number. Uh, there are very small numbers, so we, we can rely just on the width of it. But I need to explain just the, what kind of test it is. I told you that uh, in, from a business perspective, we really want uh, to improve uh, and measure maybe the case uh, in which the queue is empty and a burst of load uh, arrive immediately. Okay. So which kind of test can represent very fairly this kind of behavior? You have a producer, you have a consumer, and the producer <coughs> will uh, offer a burst of messages, B versus signs, and will wait until the consumer has finished. With the wait, uh, I mean spin waiting. So he's not actually talking the track. He's uh, something more active. It's a kind of a round trip time. Uh, offer cost because uh, it account for the time that the consumer needed to take all the element and tell the producer yes I'm finished and the, 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 the producer will move on and will start again. It means that the first element offered by the, the producer will have the queue completely empty. It makes sense. Given that I'm the only one offering on the queue and I'm waiting that the, all the element will be consumed, the queue is always empty when it starts. So it's very fair for that kind of scenario. How much it costs is in nanosecond per operation. With operation, we mean the burst, okay, the entire burst. With the burst of one, is the first one here. You will get the three contenders. One is the one we have built by all the optimization, the array queue. The second one is the concurrent linked queue inside the Java collection toolkit. And the third one is the linked block queue queue that is inside of many, many, many and every possible executor service by default. Very important. So you know how much it costs. 
when you call it and ask for a future point get. That's exactly the same, it's a round trip cost, right? In that case, uh, you won't have a big difference between them. You have uh, about 200 a second, per second, 400 for the concurrent link Q, and 800 for the link blocking. It's just uh, three times cheaper, the less the better, obviously. Okay. But it, it kind of makes sense because uh, I told you from the beginning that the caches uh, work in a cache line. So if you just do one operation, uh, the hardware won't be very friendly with you. But in that case, uh, in which case uh, from a domain perspective, you will get just uh, one element to work with. It's very complex. In general, you will get several packets, several messages, several things to work with. So things will get more interesting, considering the, the optimization we have done. When you get 10 burst sites and 100 burst sites, with the 10 burst sites, uh, as the math suggests correctly, you will get uh, 10 per more cost uh, for the concurrent linked queue. So it's nearly 2,000 nanoseconds, so 2 microseconds. But uh, the array queue, we get just uh, twice the cost. That's strange, because uh, I'm expecting uh, 10 times more, given that I'm pushing 10 element versus 1. But uh, I'm, it costs uh, just uh, double. But it makes sense if we consider the kind of optimization we have done. And the blocking, uh, linked blocking queue, we just but it's important, it's the one on the executor service. Always remember about that. Then we have the burst of 100. <coughs> and uh, finally, we get uh, 10 per cost. That's strange, because we are sending 100 element. Okay. But uh, the concurrent linked queue, we get uh, 8 times more nearly 10. From the mathematical point of view, it makes sense, because uh, the burst is 10 more, you will get nearly 10 more cost. It's a linked queue. What I told you about linked queue can't be prefetched the next value. So you need to get to the current before getting to the next. And then you always pay exactly the math don't lie here. 10 more element, 10 more cost. You can't optimize. With array, things can be good. And the blocking linked uh, is very bad. Don't be good. This benchmark alone is not enough, obviously. But it's quite already good. We need to check the amount of garbage <coughs> produced, for example. Why? Because the garbage creates this line, with the black line is the error of the benchmark. Ever. Not, not actually the other, the variance in the, in the results. Because given that if you produce uh, 700 megabytes per second, the garbage collector at a certain point has to stop some threads in order to collect uh, your nodes. And that's create always some variance in the result of the latency for both the thread. And uh, you can see that. Uh, I don't know for whatever reason, instead of zero for the array, we get 0 0.00002 bytes that just doesn't exist, it's an error of measurement. But for the other two that are linked, uh, the concurrent the linked uh, and the linked block in Q, it's interesting. Because uh, you, you can see it, uh, but uh, with the burst, burst of one, uh, the concurrent the linked, uh, cost uh, 24 byte uh, per burst. That is exactly the size of the node. If you see how much it costs to create a you node, know, the, the footprint is exactly 24. Okay. The link and blocking queue, strangely, is doing 31. So it seems as a bigger node, if uh, as a bigger produced uh, garbage, right? With the burst of 10, uh, my expectation 
is that the number in the link and queue will create 10 more nodes. You are creating 10 nodes, so it will cost 10 more time. And indeed, there is 230. That is exactly temporary. But uh, the link and block in queue, no. It is nearly 10, but a little less. So 280, while a single node, seems, was 31. The math is strange, but math no lie. And uh, you have even the variance. While the concurrent link and queue has no variance, the, the black line is perfectly important. That's strange. With the burst of uh, 100, uh, I wouldn't want to bore you with this. With 100, uh, concurrent link and queue is fine. It's what you expect from the math. Is 2,400. Exactly 10 pair and 1,000 pair. 100 pair of the first one. But block link and queue is always very different with the big variance. And the people that always saw me first, you won't click the people because uh, you are not using another array blocking the queue. That you know is an array, maybe it's more fair. And uh, you are not telling all the stuff here. And yes, it is. The thing is that uh, you don't create just one node with the link and blocking queue. Because there is a lock. Every entrant lock. Every entrant lock. Uh, uh, if you arrive and uh, you are blocked, uh, the thread uh, is being parked, right? It's been goes <coughs> out uh, until someone will wake it up uh, and the lock will be able to make resume uh, and do the stuff inside of the lock. No. What kind of data structure is being used? A linked node, linked list. So there are two things that get created. Uh, Intermont garbage with the link and block is both the node to put a new value inside the link and block in queue, and in addition, a node if you got part. And given you have this giant lock in front of all, all the things, sometimes you have a producer that got part, sometimes you have a consumer that got part. That's why you have this high degree of garbage. So if you think that it's a good idea to use this kind of data structure for the executor service and say that it will allow me to go parallel, you won't go parallel. You will create a garbage. You have created the garbage generator. That's important. <laughs> but it's fine. Important to know. Now you have responsibility for that. <laughs> and some of my mates told me, yes, Franz, but uh, if you don't tell me the throughput, I don't know how to think. Is your super cool queue. And uh, yes, I can tell you the truth, but it's a lie as well. What is a lie? And in many websites, including the InfoQ, I hope it's a register recorded. But in many sites, this kind of benchmark always are being published when people tell you I'm in the fastest queue ever, but uh, it's mostly a lie. But why is a lie? I want to for example, a, a fair benchmark to demonstrate it uh, is a benchmark that accounts uh, not only to see what's the throughput uh, of the operation, so the amount of time you, uh, you are able to offer or you are able to hold for you uh, the whole uh, round uh, trip. But you need to count other two things. The amount of time you got back pressured from the producer, so you return noise full, is important, and the amount of time in which the queue will return that's empty. Why? We know why. I told you before with the caches. If I have a benchmark that most of the time you tell me that is always empty the queue, while you know that you have a producer that is continuously producing a consumer that is continuously consuming, probably your consumer is slowing down your queue. So which kind of number you are getting if compared with another queue that doesn't act like that? 
is a fair comparison? Maybe not, because you are not measuring this same exact new space. With a round trip case, uh, yes, because you will start for the three Q always in the same state. That's called the steady state of the benchmark. Okay? So th that's not a talk about how to not benchmark, but it's really related about it. Okay? And uh, you can see it by the number. The first, uh, no, no fancy graphics, graphics yeah, it's too complex, too very often. Uh, the array Q, we have the offer field that is near zero. Okay? That is the is full. The pulse fail that is, is empty is near zero. And the throughput of the consumer that obviously is matched with the producer in the case of a uh, queue is nearly 300 million of messages per second. It's quite a lot. And I have a very slow server at home. In my laptop, I got nearly uh, 5 million. 500 million of messages per second. Maybe it's the fastest queue ever. Probably it is. Doing some math with the speed of the caches is eating the limit of the caches. So probably it is the fastest you can build. You can build another one faster in the same way. But the compare and the linked queue, we will get zero offer failed. So it's never full. But it makes sense because it's unbounded. You won't ever get full Q. But the poll field is uh, 10 million. And if you compare the number of poll field with the number of polls made, in which you got effectively reading something, is half. <coughs> so it's probab probably the kind of throughput you are getting that is just five million of operation per second is slowing down because you are continuously uh, disturbing your producer. That's why it's so slow. We have to prove it yet. It's just a theory. But it makes sense because we are measuring something more interesting than what you can find on the internet for this kind of benchmark. And the same for the linked blocking queue is totally unreliable. You can't tell what the real throughput of this queue have because you have failed for both sides. So in which state you are measuring things? You know in which state. Sometimes it's empty, sometimes it's full, sometimes not. It's complex to say that it's a fair benchmark. And maybe it won't match in your case, in your business case. So their number doesn't mean anything. But let's prove at least the number Link at Q theory. If uh, we made uh, the consumer do some work uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the element uh, just called, uh, it allows the producer to move forward, right? Not just a lot of work, just a little bit. Okay? And in that case, uh, you will see three different, very different theory, two different theory. The array Q now is getting the queue all of the time full, continuously. It means that it's so fast to produce and the consumer is so slow that it's always full. So it's, me it's measuring a very different scenario from before, which was perfectly streaming, you know, produce, consume, produce, consume. With the concurrent drink and queue, the throughput has been doubled. Now you don't have any more 5 million of messages per second, but you have nearly 8, 9 million per second. And if you look at the pulse field, the time in which the consumer got an empty queue, now you have zero. So our previous theory that probably disturbing continuously the producer is not good for the throughput of the, of, of the queue. It means that now it's measuring another all different case. Okay. And you can't compare these two Q anymore. One is always full, and the other is right. You don't know what you are measuring here. And in the other case is even worse. 
So these three things uh, are apple, orange, and melon. You, you can't compare each other. You need to be the proper benchmark in order to do So yes, I can tell you <coughs> that's the best thing you can get. Yeah. But I can tell you <coughs> that this one is the best that can be done for the company. It's not fair. Okay. And that's a bonus. You can click on the presentation right in the end, so in the, in the blue line. And uh, I told you the, the, the presentation is basically finished, it's the only or the last slide. Uh, I, I, as I said, uh, some of the cues uh, built for GC tools are being used in net in a lot of different high performance projects. Some of them Sadly, can tell the, the users, uh, okay, let's make it bounded. It's not that easy. There are several reasons, including the user expectation, especially when we use this kind of tools with the executor service. And the same should be said, said about uh, being a single producer. So, single producer, single consumer is important for many scenarios. But sometimes you need to build a bounded multi producer single consumer. Are exactly the kind of queue that uh, are being used for actor based thing, with the event loop. Because you have an event loop, one time per core, and then you don't want to have several queues to allow the other to talk to you. You will provide a one mailbox, that is an NPSC bounded queue, and anyone can talk with you by offering inside of that okay. So it's important for that kind of architecture. The state of art, uh, ah, the, this test is the round trip uh, time, okay, the burst one, with the 100 the burst. On the x-axis, you have the number of producers, <coughs> and on the y-axis, you have the cost. So the less, the better, as always. The red is the state of art at the moment. The blue is the one that will be pushed in the new version of the library. Okay? Why is this so important? It is not so important, it's just curiosity. If you want to go and look to this library, it's so stupid, the blue one, that you will be shocked. It's actually probably it's built by me. But that's why it's stupid. I'm not that good in complex domain logic. And I found the way, it's the only, probably the, the only queue that means something like that. It's not using a competitive algorithm. That's why it's kind of special. It's cooperative. Most of the queues uh, that are multi producer, as I told you before, are log free. It means that uh, if uh, we are competing, uh, offering on the queue. One win, the other lose. Right. The, the, the thing is that uh, maybe it can be different the reality. And I build a queue that uh, when you win, you allow other to win as well, maybe a little bit. And uh, it allows the overall system to make a little progress altogether. And that's why the more producer we have and uh, much less variance on the behavior. You will allow any producer to make progress. It's quite interesting. So I invite you to go and look up on the algorithm and if you match these kind of cases with the executor sizes and most of the time it's like that because you have many offering and maybe three, four consumer that are consuming. It can be a good match. Advertising in my case. <laughs> Let's finish. Stop. Thank you. I know it's long, I know it's late, but uh, please, uh, if you have any possible question, it's fine. Um, please go ahead. If you are curious about Charging is a. Uh, I was just wondering if um, adding persistence and transaction would change uh, the uh, overall solutions uh, that you presented to us. 
with, with persistence, so you mean uh, that the consumer will uh, perform something on a disk, for yes. example? Yes, guarantees not to lose uh, what has been uh, produced. Okay. Uh, in that case, uh, if you think about uh, effectively, right now, when you have durability inside of the mix, uh, what durability is? Uh, is a, a kind of contract in which uh, you have several parties that agree on something. You can be just between you and the disk that will tell you, yes, it's done. Or it can be through a quote-unquote algorithm between uh, different parties. It's unimportant if you think about Kafka. Okay. Okay. It's very high level, but the point is that you need to agree with someone that uh, the value is stable. Remember the universal stability law. It adds the number of parties with the cost of coherency. So obviously it depends on how many steps and how much it costs to ask another, in this case, this one, that the value is stable. It can be the reason why the queue won't be fast anymore. Depend, uh, just uh, depend on your disk. If you have a disk that is able in one nanosecond, but can exist one nanosecond, it can be several nanoseconds. Tell you that uh, it's durable, it won't change that much. Because it's similar to the cost that you can have by doing something. Okay? It, using different cues for different stuff, it really shifts the cost to the party you are most interested in. If you are putting this or other interaction in the mix, it really depends on how much they cost if compared with the cost of communication with the queue. The queue is actually very fast. If you are, if you need to do, to do stuff that uh, is basically not uh, asking this or other, allows you to be as fast uh, as the caches can be. But if you put in the mix something that is lower than the cache, then you will be slower. But uh, the queue is a, is a tool to the couple, producer and customer. So, if as a producer you batch uh, your uh, offers and you just need to await uh, that uh, the entire batch will, will be durable, okay? maybe you can lower that cost in that way somehow because you don't need that each one of the elements to be stable. Okay? You have sent 10 elements, after 10 elements you tell, okay, both 10 are fine. Probably you have less communication, you will be faster. Yeah. It's a very high level uh, answer, but uh, I will uh, give you uh, an idea. Yeah, yeah. Between uh, the, the single producer and the multiple producer you show uh, at the end, uh, is it similar data structures uh, underneath, or can you completely different? different? You can you can represent an unbounded uh, queue with a ring buff or with a ring. That's it. Yes. How, how, how do you represent an unbounded? Uh, I I did uh, something copying from the idea the idea that. They have to solve the issue of the Qubit router. Uh, for that, uh, I build a linked list of array. So I build a linked list of array. Each of the array acts like a ring buffer and uh, allows, by using a, a one instruction, that there is one instruction on the, on the CPU that uh, won't fail. Because we have two kinds of uh, operations you can do if you have an atomic lock, for example, and you want to move forward uh, the sequence. You know? And the uh, one is uh, x add, called uh, uh, in the other way, get and increment, and the other is compare and set, or compare and swap. Compare and swap, if you look at the, the, the API, return a boolean. So it means uh, that can fail. How can fail? If another 
is doing the same. So you, you provide from which value you, you are starting, which value you want to be. And given that another producer has moved forward the sequence instead of you, you will fail that you have to retry it. How much time you have to retry it, you don't know. So it's in the land of a log free algorithm because it can take an infinite amount of retry. And uh, the state of art uh, is uh, actually a good uh, implementation, but uh, if you can look on the, the cost of offering, uh, this cost uh, changes suddenly and has a lot of degree of, of variance because of that, because the more you are, the more you fail. And the more you fail, the more you don't know when you will be able to ask again. Okay? It's the an unfair algorithm. <coughs> My version is using that increment that allows anyone always to move forward. But what's the problem with that? And that's why it's unbounded is that you have to move forward. So if you have a, it, it can be given another talk, but I'm going to be very sure. It, it just is what the thing is. The trick is uh, very, so simple that I that, uh, like, like any, I believe mean, that probably the, the better camper and user, I saw, I saw right now a very simple one, and mine effectively is very simple. So you have uh, your chunk here, okay? and you use uh, this operation uh, called uh, x add uh, that makes uh, zero, it became uh, one. And then if another arrived, it became two, three, whatever. If you have a chunks uh, of the finite sites, uh, for example, four, you can use this uh, nice numerical tool. Consider the case in which uh, you have two chunks uh, connected by an X and the previous uh, pointers. Okay? And uh, I can tell you that uh, this element has uh, an ID of zero. This element will have an ID of one, two, three. This one will have four, five, six, seven. This chunk will have an ID, the, the whole chunk, an ID of zero. This chunk can be an ID of one. If you have a producer sequence here, how can you encode inside of it uh, these two information? The two information are the ID of the element inside of the queue and uh, the ID of the chunk itself. You can use a string that is very simple. Right? If you have the number six, you can use the model operand to know in which offset you are and the division to know in which chunk. Okay. So you have uh, one number here that uh, increases monotonically that uh, has two important information. In which chunk I want to offer a value and in which element I want to offer a value. Right now, I'm not thinking about the average or other. It's just a, a really infinite uh, data structure, right? Very, very simple to think about. It. So, arrive four producer. Both of them increment this producer sequence, and uh, they know where they want to write, right? So, they will write here, 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 here. Let's consider the case in which uh, here there is no chunk yet, right? But uh, another, the fourth 
producer with a rally but with a government again to four right four has two information as we have seen the first information is the offset of the new chunk I want to write in that is zero because it wanted to write in that element of the this not existent chunk yet okay and it really want that the chunk ID will be one we have one pointer called the producer buffer that at the moment point here okay the this producer look at the producer buffer check the index and, and check that 0 is less than 1 so only in that case we'll use the compare and set operation trying to increase the chunk index from 0 to 1 ok that's the very interesting part of it what happens if <coughs> he has failed in the old algorithm if you fail it means just one thing that you have to retry but if you have failed it means that another one has created the same chunk because you probably want to write in the same chunk so you are collaborating with another yes you have failed but probably it's okay and you move forward finish that's the order it's very simple as I told you because it, it embraces the fact that as a producer you have other that want you the same things why challenge them? it's much better to go get ownership of the things but knowing that you are acting for a, a shared good right? it's a common skill I don't know how to do it it's very political kind of thing and it's simple and it works very well What's this is the old algorithm. 